Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, I hope you guys are keeping safe and doing well. Welcome again to um, another APG Young Professionals Technical Talk. Um, today we have with us Mr. Vitas Myers. Mr. Myers is a technical sales consultant with Landmark, which is a product service line of Halliburton. He has a background in geology, both in oil and gas and mining over the last 10 years. Today, his presentation is titled, Sharpen Your Subsurface Understanding. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Myers. And just a reminder to keep your microphones muted for the duration of the talk. And if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat box below, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. So Mr. Myers, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking your time to come out this afternoon and hearing about this. From what I perceive that you all will be uh, young professionals in the geoscience uh, sector. And what I have to show you, you guys today would be of interest to you all, all right? Um, today, we're gonna try and split it into two parts. One would be on Halliburton Landmark's seismic engine. And if we have time, we will go on to the automated Mythology interpretation. All right. So that might be a mouthful, but let's see if we could manage it. All right. I hope that, um, I don't know if Karis could tell me that we can have an interactive session um, if, if needs be. People could ask questions and whatnot. They could unmute their mic and ask questions if they could, right? Karis? Charis? Oh, yeah, that's no yeah. problem. That's okay, no great. All right, then. so let's move ahead. All right, so let's start off first with seismic engine powered by Decision Space 365. All right, and once again, my name is Dina Smiles. Okay, so seismic interpretation is something that has been the mainstay of geoscience in today's environment. We utilize seismic a lot in understanding the subsurface. And there are some challenges with this, and there are some benefits. And one of the big challenges we have is dealing with the, the large amount of volume of data that we, we're dealing with. And what um, seismic interpretation allows for is that we could do mathematical computations on this seismic information to produce uh, seismic attributes that would be of interest to us that we be able to get certain values that would be of interest to us. And we can do geophysical algorithms for it. And with Seismic Engine, it allows us to have this done in a very efficient manner. So as I spoke of before, we have some uh, challenges that people normally deal with. Now, the first two challenges in the list is around the technologies and the data itself. Seismic data sizes continue to grow, and we have seen this year by year, with, normally with our customers here at Landmark. Here on the right hand, you see where we have a clear documented example of how seismic data is growing. The diagram shows how the log trace density of the seismic over time has increased by 10 times each decade. So just the density alone is increasing at a very fast rate. Also, a uh, fact that the spatial extent of the seismic survey is also increasing. So you have generated a huge amount of data. So the amount of data and the size of the data, the density data is becoming bigger and bigger. Another challenge is that um, geophysical algorithms, you can have a geophysical algorithm also, and they continue to become more complex and they require more interactions, more CPU power, more GPU power as it uh, goes on and on. And these are two big challenges, but the solution, it doesn't just um, reside in maximizing the power or the processing power of the machine that you utilize in, you know, for every individual to office, because that will be at a great expense. And rather than being best all this amount in hardware and stuff like that, and you have to worry about uh, natural disasters and, and whatnot, what Seismic Engine offers, it utilizes the cloud to um, host the seismic data and perform the different actions on it that would be 
of user. Okay, so and it's also a way for operators to um, to make in a more efficient manner the task of having to do repetitive repetitive um, things to do in a way that is to be more efficient for the operator to utilize, thus making ensuring that time is spent in the most uh, useful area. So decision space seismic engine, what is it? And we have a screenshot here of what it looks like. And it is the first cloud native scalable seismic processing engine. Okay, so this is not a software that is uh, downloaded onto a computer and you run it based on the processing power of your own computer. It is run on the cloud where this will be a external um, processing center. So the, the capabilities of the processing is, is much beyond what anybody can have host on their own computer or even on a server. All right, so it's, it's optimally scaled and positioned to manage what it is the job that is being done. So it's done in the best way possible. Is the industry standard and advanced industry standard and advanced post-stacking seismic attributes. So what you can do, you can have post-stack seismic attributes. It could be a run on this in the quickest way possible. We know sometimes that these attributes might take a while to run. And after you spend a lot of time running these attributes, sometimes you might be satisfied what is done. With uh, the S365 seismic engine, you have the optimum engine to run such a task, all right? It has over 100 plus attributes, tools, and processes available at this moment, and we continue to add more, as well as it has an extensive, extensive framework of linking and running geophysical algorithms, all right? On this right-hand side there, you see a workflow of how you would have your sizing processing done, where you would have an input, and then you would have your output coming out there in accordance to how you would like it. And this now will go to form the foundation for landmark assisted seismic interpretation solution. So what is the value proposition of this? That the S365 seismic engine enables for rapid computation of advanced seismic attributes to solve conventional and unconventional reservoir challenges by utilizing elastically scalable cloud computation to accelerate attribute processing on seismic volumes of any size without the need to reduce fidelity or subdivide the data. Okay, so basically you would have the uh, a certain amount of seismic that you will have, and let's say in, in a segway format, you upload it to our seismic engine, you can run your attributes, your computations, whatever it might be, and then it gives the output of the data that you would need in a rapid succession. All right. Uh, some in, for some, it might, this might sound simplistic, but we're going to see some applications of that where it will benefit. And the value delivered is that seismic engine, uh, the S365 core application, is the industry's first cloud native software that enables you to link and run advanced geophysical algorithms and post stack attributes on terabytes of 3D seismic data. Okay, so three, uh, terabytes of data normally takes a lot of work to be done, but with this now you get to speed up what is required of you. All right, and even as you increase in scale as the seismic area that you're dealing with, you know, will magnify, this would work alongside that and not slow you down. All right. And the importance of the cloud is something that Landmark really wants to focus on in that we believe that the future of our industry will be cloud-based, meaning that it wouldn't be a heavy uh, investment in a lot of infrastructure that might be residing on the plant or in your office, but it would be um, infrastructure that would be resided in the most optimum place and then stream to you. For example, in a situation that we are in right now where most of us are working from home and we are required to stay home, 
a cloud solution provides that you don't lose that amount of productivity that you would have because you don't have the resources available to you. With a cloud solution, you are able to utilize it anywhere in the world. All right. That being in your office, or that could be in your home, that could be, um, you know, you on a business trip, anything like that, and you are able to maximize that. And one of the attributes that is of great importance to us is Ford likelihood attributes. This is the this allows for the automation of finding faults. All right, it's not finding errors, but finding discontinuities in rocks where it is. Um, normally, a geoscientist could take several hours um, going through uh, a multi seismic, and as the seismic expands, it would take more and more people, more and more days, and it could consume a lot of their time. But for uh, like the attributes, allows for this to be done in a very, very efficient manner. All right, and all that is while well, it's being done, we want to preserve data fidelity, we don't want to change the data. We want to ensure that we have a clear part of how the data is managed to the eventual output. And if it is, we see that anything needs to be done over, we can go back and repeat the steps. Okay. So, the Air Seismic Engine, it will utilize um, a format type of SegY, seismic data. And you can, this is an industry standard. Um, seismic format. It utilizes the flexibility to link algorithms and tools and enables you know, what it is you would require of this seismic to perform, as well as multivariate seismic data analysis um, methods. Okay, so you can do multivariate seismic plots, see if it is you want to remove areas that are not of interest to you, you know, as well as for like your calculations. And that is for cloud computer. So we can do multiple fault interpretations on large amounts of seismic, or even small amounts if you want. So people might be aware that other providers might have some form of fault automation. All right. And normally people might be familiar with the attribute or discontinuity attribute where you are able to run a discontinuity attribute on a piece of seismic, it shows up some amount of discontinuities, as you will see there on the animation on your left, but it is not always the clearest. What Landmark offers is our advanced force likelihood algorithm, which utilizes um, a volume of seismic, and then it creates three different algorithms, three different uh, attributes, which all come together to form our tracking volume. Okay, those three different attributes are likelihood, as you mentioned this. Okay, and they would all come together to, to, to produce our tracking volume. And if you were to compare the two of them side by side, as the, the animation does there, you would see that the areas that would be of interest to us in, in, in the form of faults are a lot more clearer. And rather than you going through one by one on every different intersection, every different cross section, every different whatever it might be to try to pick out faults, this automates it in a very fast time. All right. So as I said before, we utilize this workflow here and it utilizes machine learning for likelihood attributes where it is the we would input certain uh, qualities that we would like to have the machine interpret our seismic for and therefore it, this is where we understand the whole concept of machine learning where it would see how things are done in the past you could adjust them and then it would go in forward in terms of correction. It would self-correct. So it always is a continual loop of iteration where it is, it looks to improve itself more and more in terms of finding where these areas of interest might be to you. 
So for likelihood is a good example of how we could test how this is being done. So in the graph you will see on your right hand side there, you would see where there is half a gigabyte of seismic data operating on a workstation. And if it is, you were to run a fourth likelihood attribute on a workstation, it would take for about half, half a gigabyte, it would take one hour to compute uh, something similar to this. Now, if it is you were to utilize uh, that same workstation to do something much larger, like five gigabytes, which is a much more typical size of um, a small volume we might see here in Trinidad or wherever it may be have you, it will take up to eight hours to do that. You know, sometimes people talk about leaving a computer to run overnight, you know, running attributes, and then they would come in next morning and find the computer crash or something like that, and they have to start all over again. But with utilizing Seismic Engine, which is cloud-based, we have the optimization of servers where that same five gigabyte seismic volume that would have taken eight hours on a workstation would take you just a few minutes on seismic engine, all right? And as well as if it is you utilize larger volumes, much larger volumes, the, you know, going into the terabyte size, you could do it at a much more optimized level than any workstation in the XA server that you might have within your environment. All right. So this has some comparisons that you may be dealing with when you're looking at seismic. We see in the top left hand corner there where the original seismic might be. And if it is you go to run the typical dip stair discontinuity to try to pick out faults, you see them looking kind of obscure there. And you go through that. And we have our own attributes there that we could run as well. But when it is you use um, seismic engine likelihood to get that tracking volume, you can be able to see clear delineations of faults there. And then you can optimize into your seismic and have it be overlaid, where it is you could more understand how that seismic could look with those faults. So when it is you see the last, um, the last image there, the bottom right hand corner, where it says original optimized, it looks and it makes much more sense and it gives a, a better interpretation. Now, somebody could have done this by themselves, but when it is you have a large volume and you want to have it done rapidly and efficiently, the seismic engine allows for this to happen, saving yourself a lot of time and even a lot of it. <laughs> you know, sometimes this could be very taxing on us. All right. So the fault volume generation, as we talked about before, that it utilizes our conventional attributes that we would have run, and then we merge them all together to produce volumes that would be of greater interest to us, okay? And as well, we utilize this whole concept of machine learning now to help improve what it is we constantly do. So the idea is that we utilize the machine to examine what it is we currently have done, and then we work forward with that going forward. And then that machine continually learns where it is the mistakes that is being made, and it would refine that to make better interpretations as it go forward. So again, here we have our machine learning fault probability, where it would have an interpretation where it would perceive where force might, bend, might have been. But then when it is we, we run the seismic engine fault likelihood, it would do further improvements on that. All right, and as the more you utilize it, the more it improves, okay? So we can look at a case study of some seismic fault identification in the Neovara formation. 
in the uh, DJ, Basin, DJ Basin that is in Colorado, United States. So we had this operator that they were interested in um, understanding some areas of shale and chalk in the base bed that they wanted to do some horizontal drilling for gas, all right? But they knew that the area was uh, very faulted and a lot of small scale faults, some of it that might have been perceived very well on the site. So they wanted to have a rapid anticipation of this area so that they could understand the areas of faulting. And this would more come into play, especially with horizontal drilling, seeing that they would be going directly perpendicular to the axis of these faults. And they want to ensure that they, they maintain the beds that they would be drilling in. All right, so you will see the image above where you the fault likelihood was, was run on the seismic. And then you are able to see where areas of faulting might occur. And we see where, where this matters along the well border. So with the areas of faulting, and they were able to be mapped, we could now have a better interpretation of the subsurface, as you will see below there. So when they were able to execute the drilling in the, with the horizontal drilling there, it was able to maintain that bed that is important to them in terms of accessing the gas within that shale bed. So, and as you would know with horizontal drilling, it goes across a very wide area. So this saved them a lot of time in terms of analysis, all right? And that is just one aspect of the S365 uh, seismic engine and the whole aspect of of it, the whole the total encompassing um, understanding of seismic engine is that we want to automate a lot of the processes that are very time consuming within seismic interpretation, and that comes um, as early as acquisition all the way to interpretation. All right, and we are not entirely there yet but we are getting there all right we are we have machine learning velocity modeling we have uh, machine learning noise attenuation we want to be able to have some form of machine learning uh loading of field data and as you have seen where in the post fact seismic where we have um, attribute generation and machine learning attributes, as well as being able to interpret horizons in multiple layers and being able to understand that. Um, interpreting salt and species detection. You know, in Trinidad, they might encounter much salt, but we do encounter a lot of mud that appears, especially in the Southland. So we want to be able to interpret those as well, all right? And this is where we see the industry going, utilizing machine learning to produce automated results, where it is the geoscientists will now come in afterwards and QC. All right. Some might think, well, boy, you know, is this going to be taken away our potential and our jobs and whatnot? But actually, what it is we are seeing in the industry is that a lot of um, experienced people are retiring and, and moving out and there's a knowledge gap there of experience uh, follow up so even though right now we might think that uh, you know, there is a lot of room for everybody we want to have it that uh, in time to come if it is there's a shortage of uh, professionals that a lot of this will could be done by um, machine learning algorithm and then the geoscientists will come in after and clear it up. And for operators, they see this as something beneficial to them. And we see that this is where the industry is going. So for those of you who are still in school, 
if or you are within your work environment, be ready to see this as a site near you. And you know, don't be challenged, just appreciate it, but you know, learn to learn the fundamentals as well before it is you go forward to approaching some of these uh, more automated functions. All right. Any questions? Hi guys, oh, we'll I leave this me. floor open. Yeah, for any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and you could go ahead and ask. All right. If you're a little shy, we would then go on to another topic. Just allow me to switch here. involve a little bit more geology. Probably you can just compound the questions to this. So. Vitas, before before we move on, I guess I I mm -hmm. actually have a question. So yeah. I work in data management in the ministry. So stuff mm -hmm. like this always comes up. Um, so if a company would like to implement then um, implement this what what sort of hardware and software requirements would they need um what kind of issues for example with connectivity um might we encounter stuff like that if you were to implement this right so if you were to implement it all you have to do is press on on any computer and it's there all right <laughs> this is the benefit of of, of cloud-based technology so you know in the same way if um well I, I don't consider myself that old but i remember back in the days where when you wanted to watch a movie or walk down to the you know the corner video store you rent a vhs you come home you watch it you rewind it you carry it back right but time has evolved where it is you have something like netflix where it is you have you put on your tv you have thousands of options you press play you watch it and then you, you go ahead right and that's that that's an example of cloud-based solutions so for movie watching. In the same way, we're providing cloud-based solutions for geoscience. So you know, all the tools, everything is on the web. It, the only thing that is being streamed to you are the pixels. So the amount of processing and everything that is being done off-site. All right. So in a case like the ministry, you will acquire the seismic from the operator, you upload it, and from there it's safely stored in um, under SOC2 uh protection and uh, you can run the amount of algorithms that you want to your heart desire multiple amounts you don't have to worry about storage and stuff like that and you get the results that you want if it is you want to download it to, to the computer that you would want to have on site you can go ahead and do that but it runs much quicker on the cloud Okay, cool, cool. The um the example with Netflix really um was very relatable to me. So thanks mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um hi, I'm not I'm not sure if I missed it, but I know mm -hmm. you said that geologists would have to go back in and QC the identifications made, but what is the level of accuracy associated with um this feature? And this is specific to the, the for um, likelihood. Yeah. Right. So, um, as well, the understanding of faults is that when once it is you have seismic, there are some clear faults that you you're able to see, and then there are some that might not be visible to you, but within the algorithm of the within the data of the, of the seismic itself, it, it could tell where there are discrepancies, and they would point that out to you. So, mm -hmm. how it will be done is that each different fault that is created it would be in a QC mode where you could actually go and say, and then you know, in a QC mode meaning that it's not a real fault as yet. So you can actually go into each fault and say, I want this fault to be real. I want this fault to be deleted. And you could go, that, go, go into that with every fault that, it, that you, if it doesn't put, all right? As well as you could merge faults together, you could um, edit faults that it might produce or anything like that. So it just, um, 
cut down on the amount of your time because if you were not an interpreter, I mean, doing fourth interpretation nine o'clock in the morning is much different than doing fourth interpretation three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, after a while you're a bit tired, you might just be like, mm -hmm. whatever, I've seen this thing, something like that. So with this now, it kind of eliminates a lot of that and it just now, it just allows now for you to go forward now and just say, okay, I want to make this real, I want to make this, um, I want to make this fake and delete it or whatnot and go forward and then you, you present it with results. So it doesn't just interpret the entire volume for you and you just have to deal with that and accept it as, as it is. No, you, you go in there and you correct as it seems, as, as you see fit. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so now we go on to assisted mythology interpretation. All right, so this as well is very similar to Seismic Engine, but um, we're dealing with logs now. All right. Let's see what's going on here. Right. So with mythology and mythology interpretation, we sometimes face some challenges in uh, NOC that I'm very familiar with. You know, the challenge that they have is standardization. And that is they would have problems where one interpreter might be interpreting in one way, while another interpreter will be interpreting in a different way. You know, they will be generous with their mythology interpretations, another might be. Um, you yeah, have dealing with legacy data. Yeah, you might be dealing with different uh, fields. You know, people dealing with uh, different logs for different um, wells, all these different types of things like that. And things are not standardized, and that is both a challenge, as well as scalability, meaning that you might be faced with a field with, where you might do a bunch of uh, wireline acquisitions and you dump with a bunch of logs. And you have to utilize the storm going forward. So that is a challenge as well. And integration, seamless integration. So the idea is that you might find yourself, whether you utilize, um, I don't want to call any brand names, or always, but um, if you utilize uh, third party software, and you might be dealing with. Um, being able to the challenge of transferring data from one branch and another, something like that, you would need to have some amount of integration that is going on there. And um, the quantitative uncertainty, and this basically speaks to the accuracy depending on the mythology and well log qualities are normally like around 80 to 85%. So the ability for users to adjust to only using the highest accuracy is sometimes what you would be faced with, all right? So you would want to have something that would be unbiased in terms of its interpretation of multiple logs. And this would be some of the challenges that you might face. Now, I know I started off with seismic, and um, when I spoke with uh, Mark, he told me that Seismic would be of interest to you all, but as well as seismic, I know that in Trinidad, the context most of the times is that we deal with a lot of logs and interpretation of those logs, and, and sometimes the interpretation of those logs would tend to govern over your view of the seismic. So, this idea of quantitative uncertainty uh, factors in a lot because sometimes our interpretation of logs so skew our interpretation of the seismic that um, we need to have them standardized in a certain way. All right. So decision space 365 assisted lithology interpretation. Again, is a cloud-based application. All right, so this is not installed on a PC. This will be on our cloud where it is you will be able to upload your data and it utilizes optimized machinery to run the lithology interpretation on these logs and thereby spitting out the information that is useful to you. 
All right, so this is something that is of interest to a lot of us, as well as, and the benefit of this is that with our scalable cloud architecture, you know, multiple amount of wells could be, could be processed in a matter of minutes. All right, and we know that one thing with Trinidad, we have no shortage of wells. We have thousands of wells everywhere with legacy data and also some recent data. So this will be able to handle a lot of those interpretations. And even you might be able to run uh, interpretation once, and you can do several different iterations of those interpretations based on additional information that might be coming in. So you will be able to um, improve upon what you, you know about. So one thing I talk about any other side is touch on, but it's going to talk on here that you have trained mythological models. All right. And these models are models that we have developed based on different areas where it is you could input it and it would understand the area and therefore put out the lithology that best suits that area. All right. As well as you can create your own models. And, or you can modify the existing models there that are included so that you can find things that are specific to our area and our region or your own interpretation. All right. So the benefit of this is that it allows for um, improved workflow time in terms of interpreting multiple amounts of wells and given you a certain amount of uh, in a better interpretation, as well as with this, you can QC the interpretation that is done as well, just as with the seismic engine, all right? And this will further go on to being utilized in things like uh, earth model, that you would be able to do large scalable earth models of areas, thereby having a further understanding of the all right. Now, this is uh, not just like a simple um, utilizing gamma ray cutoffs uh, or porosity or something like that, and you know, utilizing that for interpretation alone. This look, utilizes multiple amounts of, um, of, of curves and, and, and logs that you might be available to you, and it would most align them with the lithologies that are of interest to us. So if you look at how you would train the machine to do this now, you would input your well logs, all right? You would put in your feature engineer, which would be models that you would uh, be of interest to you. You can have feature vectors. Again, this is um, loading where it is, would be areas of interest to you that you might believe that the lithology might be a certain way. It would go ahead and do supervised learning. Then it would, um, you could again select areas where you would perceive the lithology to be of a certain type. And then it would run the machine the algorithm to understand the lithology that is there. Thus, you are going to create a probabilistic prediction model where it is you can again go in and QC and have an output of an interpreted um, mythology of different laws. All right. So this is how your data set would look like. All right. You would have um, you, you will have a, a, a well layout like this, where it is you are able to see what curves are available to you and you will utilize. And there might be interpretations of lithology that might be already there, as well as things like uh, your borehole and caliper readings would also come into play because sometimes these might affect the ability of the tool to perceive how well that um, data might be. So all these are factoring as well. And if it's on your right hand side, you see some amount of multivariate analysis as well that you are able to plot and utilize in your log interpretation, your mythology interpretation. All right. And 
a lot of the the analysis that we have utilized on this um, with industry standard uh, studies that we incorporate, you know, to the to the, the various lithology types that we would have, as well as you could input additional lithologies that would be of interest to you. All right. And one of the QC methods that we utilize in this is our prior probability feature. All right, so once it is you input your logs there and it runs the algorithm, you are given a prior probability curve. Now with your prior probability curves, it gives you, before it even um, gives you a final run-in, I should say that it would give you how well it thinks it would do an interpretation in an area. All right, so you look at that a little bit closer here now. So the prior probability would be the track on your left, all right, where that has that one curve there in that gold color. And having a prior probability of zero to one. And the prior probability, as I said before, is a way to to measure the algorithm confidence before prediction. And it recognizes what is there before. So when it is you see that it's closer to one, then you, there's a high confidence in the recognition of the log information that you would have there. But when it is you see it is trending close to zero, then you have a lower probability, prior probability and confidence of recognition. So this would inform you of what is you have before it is you would run your lithology prediction, all right? And then you will have your posterior probability, which uh, is a measure of likelihood of a given lithology. So after this, you will run your calculation, then this is like a, a understanding of what, how, what it came up with, and sometimes even what were the other considerations that came into play. All right. So you would have the posterior prob probability, which is the track on your right, as it shows there with all those multiple colors. All right. So this here now, as you would correct this, it improves the machine learning and the ability to predict further down the road. Uh, all right. So you would see in this area of brown there where it is the majority of the posterior prob probability was sandstone. So then it would give a, a better lithology interpretation of that area being sandstone. So you could understand that um, in this area, there was a, initially when it is we, we did the analysis, the prediction was that, the prior probability prediction was that it was good. And then the posterior probability, meaning that this area here is very confident that this area here is shady sandstone. All right. But um, what's, did I put that wrong? Or probably I should say that in the area above, um, that area there, that the, the high probability of shady sandstone is predicted, a lower chance that his mother has recognized any other slicky. So you're more sure of what's going on there. But while below the higher probability, the limestone is predicted a lower chance that the mother has recognized uh, any cases. All right, so in the law, in that place below there, the understanding there is that yes, it is you found um, uh, a good probability of it being that limestone. There was other chances of other things as well, but the, the greater interpretation here is for limestone. So, Again, you can go through and in a, although it is an um, a automated interpretation or assisted interpretation, you can now go through here and QC and be able to verify what it is the, the algorithms have given you, all right? And as you QC and you improve upon it, machine learns it and it would go on now to improve, all right? And in this area here, you see it's a lot more uh, ambiguous. So even more so, you would want to have that interpreted, all right? And a further case study, like 
as we did in the seismic engine. We have an uh, area there in northern Alaska, that's the Barrow area. I think this is one of the largest uh, oil producing areas in um, the United States. All right. So we had a, a user where it is the, um, they had a number of different wells where they wanted to do a very quick evaluation on. And what we were able to do was utilize uh, 14 of those wells based on the, the log information. And then as well as those were interpreted, they were applied to the whole 113. And the benefit of this is that rather than they spent a lot of time with uh, geologists uh, you know, slaving over interpretation of these logs. They have to present it to one another. It, they will issue them on themselves and whatnot. And then you can have errors of bias and everything being applied there. The benefit of this is that you know one complete standard is applied to all the logs in the area. They are interpreted. They, they can all come together and QC it. And then going forward now, you have a much better um, understanding of the lithology of this area going forward. And I think in this area as well, this application um, played a greater role because of the um, seasonal variations there, where for certain times of the year, it probably is not safe to come outside because it's too cold. So um, a lot of time operators might find themselves challenged with time constraints you know, um, whether it be licenses like that might be ceasing or something like that, or even um, they might be bidding on a, on a certain area, they want to know what's potential in a certain area. Uh, the benefit of assisted lithology interpretation is that you are able to do a lot of these operations in a very rapid fashion. So the benefit of this, is a multidiscipline um, approach uh, and uh, improvements where it is it it is of benefit to the geologists as they do uh, interpretations of species and understanding structure and everything like that, as well as petrophysicists as they run their calculations on these um, logs. And the idea to provide machine learning it it helps enhance models that we could create and it could help us going forward having a standard that we would apply to all the information that we have. And as I said before, it's iterators, meaning that we would utilize it back and forth. So we, as we continue to improve upon our interpretation, we find that we have more consistent interpretations, more efficient interpretations, and um, we optimize the amount of work that we do. All right? as well as, as we spoke about the whole idea, different um, models, that you could create multiple models that you could apply to a different area. So in interpreted, interpreting the sandstones and the shady sandstones and shales in, in this area there in Alaska, as well as the Carmelite interpretation, we can see that there were three different models that they applied, all right? and some models you had more confidence in certain areas than others, all right? As well as with the cabinet interpretation, we saw that happen as well where um, different models, although they might look very close, some, they might, there are some differences in some of them. Okay, so for example, you see here, Right, so for example here, you see that there isn't, there are some inter more interspersed here of carbonate, of the sandstone and the, that shady, um, that shaly sandstone there as well, but in other areas, you don't find it as much, okay? So this whole thing is, is that it applies different models and from that now, where we as, um, interpreters or geologists might come into play, we would go in now and verify this and we would say, okay, we would more, we, we, it seems as if model two or three applies more 
or in this case here, model three here applies more than the other two models. And once we find the best model that we want to utilize, we would go forward with that throughout the multiple amount of wells that we are utilizing. All right. So you get a result now of multiple amounts of wells that are interpreted and it would help speed up the process of interpreting wide areas. And again, the end of this would be for a good earth model, all right? <clears throat> One thing we see of importance is providing a very a digital twin, or what we like to call. We want to be able to replicate what it is um, that is under the ground in a digital way on our uh, system. So with a wide understanding of the lithology, as well as a wide understanding of the framework that might be there, we can do large um, lithological models or lit models that, they, that, that might be there and therefore be able to better predict where faults might be where or, or how well the drilling might go. So you predict with the poor pressures, um, densities, and all the different types of things that come into play when it is we would be an, uh, analyzing reservoirs that might be of interest to us, where there might be better uh, migration or closures and all these different types of things. So this all comes into play and helps improve our interpretation of areas that are of interest to us and therefore save companies a lot of time, a lot of resources. Okay, now if you all want to um, see more information about this, Halliburton Landmark has our this, uh, newsletter and I can share it with the organizers of this presentation, which is you all could view it digitally and see more about things like what we have here. And this is just touches on some of the things that where Halliburton wants to go or is right now in terms of utilizing uh, machine learning and cloud technology for geoscientists. And we really see that this is where the industry is going and where it is we would want to carry our users going forward. So, um, yeah, so thanks for listening. And if you all have any questions, um, Happy to take them as much as I could. Thanks so much, Vitas. We actually have three questions in the chat, so I okay, could probably sure. read them out and then, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is, has the lithology prediction been tested against spectral gamma ray logs for different clays? What was the type of success rate of identification against the ground truth of the um, spectral gamma ray logs? Well, the, the um, speaking to us on, in specificity, I can't say um, completely yes or no, mm -hmm. but it, as we, it is a, it's an ongoing um, process that we are utilizing. And um, I would think with something like that, what you can utilize, you can, you, you can do is you can verify that interpretation with one, one that you can do yourself. I could find it on my end from our R&D team because we have utilized uh, that in our um, LI, but um, I wouldn't want to say for certain yes or no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The second question is how much log conditioning is needed to ensure that the data is okay for use by the software? And in particular, how has the algorithm behaved with historical log data? Well, it, it has done quite well, you know. Um, as, as you know, with normally with data is garbage in, garbage out. So uh, with the most in, the best logs that you can give, you will give the best results. But if it is you have uh, logs that where information is missing, that um, again, where it is you, you would see that we spoke to about the prior probability. Here's where the information is not as good. It would give you, it would analyze it before and tell you that, hey, this information that is going to be output here 
if we don't have the, the best confidence in it. So yeah, here would be the QC process coming in where it is you would, whatever it gives us the output, you would more want to look at these areas now with more circumspect. So it would save any time in the areas of higher confidence, you, it would save any time in QC in those areas, but yeah. in the areas of, of, of poor data, then it is you would have to apply. Again, you know, we want to use machine learning and cloud technology to assist us. It's, it's not a matter of we come to work one day and we press start and it gives us all the results and you go to your boss and you say, here, I work real hard on it. Yeah. You know, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of assisting us going forward. So dealing rather than you spend weeks or months, you know, doing hundreds of wells that you could spend a couple of days QCing what is done and we utilize that going forward. Right. So it's a shrink, it's a shrink will close from, from days and months to, to hours and, and, and days. Yeah. So I guess, well, this, what you just said with tying with the last question that we have, I don't know if you yeah. might have anything else to add to it, but um, the question was, are there any pilot projects in exploration areas? Um, the person would like to know, um, they would have to understand the use of machine learning when it comes to um, exploration type based areas where calibration points are few. So what are you okay. talking about? Yeah. Well, right. Um, there are, we have white papers on those. Uh, I can't recall one specifically to tell you to go to, but um, you can visit our website, landmark.solution. And if you navigate to the page on um, assisted lithology interpretation, it would point to those uh, white papers. But yes, I mean, this is the best application of air exploration, where it is you have sparse data and whatnot, because the log interpretations there, uh, they could come into play in the further forming um, lit models, where it is areas of lesser interpretation, you can now have a better insight into based on algorithms that you may, might put into place. So this, Assisted lithology interpretation, along with other tools that we have that we utilize, um, could be could be used in a exploration environment. I mean, one thing that I wish, if I had time, I could have spoken to is uh, our uh, our tool called Nestex, which um, utilizes public publicly available data that might be published, um, you know, all around the world. And even we have a lot of data right here in Trinidad and you know, the Ghana area and everything like that, where it actually does a basic analysis of areas already. So this would um, put an aid in exploration and then it, it gives you areas of um, plays that would be of interest that um, based on the sequence of lithologies that you might have that might be of interest to you in terms of hydrocarbon exploration. So there's a number of different tools. Yeah, yeah, a number of different tools that we are utilizing in, in uh, going forward with this. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Um, I don't know if anyone um on the call here has any questions. Give you a, a minute or so. Yeah. Well, if not, um, thank you so much for, um, mm -hmm. for having this talk this evening. Um, it was really informative. You know, it's really good to get um, insights into what new technology is out there. So this has been really right. great. Yeah, so well, thank yeah, you. It's a for me to be here. And I hope that, you know, the best for you all in your careers. And uh, I hope that um, one day you guys utilize these tools. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you again and keep safe okay. everyone. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.